in the south. For one reason or another the date of the mother's departure for the South Indian pilgrimage was repeatedly being postponed. However, Balaram's wife Krishnabhvini Devi had been cherishing the desire for a long time and she also entertained the hope of taking the Holy Mother to their estate at Kothar in Odisha and keeping her there for some time. It was finally settled that the Mother would start for Kothar on the 18th of Agrahayana, November to December 1910, with Golapma, Ramakrishna Babu's mother, Krishnabhvini, and his aunt, the mad aunt Surbala, and her daughter Radhu, Brahmachari Shukul, Swami Atmananda, Brahmachari Krishnalal, Sri Ramakrishna Bose, and other devotees. The mother and her women companions travelled by second class, while the men travelled by interclass. At Bhadrak station Tulsiram, brother of Swami Premananda, was present with men and palanquins and conducted them to Ramakrishna Babu's estate office. After some rest, they went to Kothar, about 18 miles away. Swami Atlananda joined them there in a few days. The whole party felt immensely happy at this place, but the condition of the mad aunt Surbala worsened owing to the mental strain consequent on living in a stranger's house. Hence she had to be sent back to Jairambati. One member of the mother's party had adopted a very strict regimen for himself for a couple of months, his argument being that he was following the mother in her austerity. But the mother one day served plenty of good food on his plate despite his protest and advised him to eat it all. The devotee obeyed for the time being, but in the afternoon he asked the mother in the course of a discussion, Why do you deny yourself the things you serve me so plentifully? The mother replied, Do I eat through one mouth? Don't be silly. I tell you, you shall eat. From that day his hesitation was over. Because of the mother's presence, the worship of Saraswati was performed that year with great eclat. On that occasion, Ramakrishna Babu and his wife took mantra from the mother. Three devotees from Shillang, Surendra Kanta Sarkar, Hemant Kumar Mitra and Birendra Kumar Mazumdar were initiated on the same day. Sri Devendranath Chatterjee, postmaster of Kothar who had embraced Christianity in youth under a blind impulse, now felt repentant and wishing to return to the Hindu fold, consulted many about the possibility of a reconversion. The news reached the ears of the mother who opined that if he performed a purificatory rite before the image of Radha Shamachand, the tutelary deity of the Kothar family, on the eve of the Saraswati worship, and then recited the Gayatri Mantra and wore the sacred thread he would be re-established in his Brahmanhood. Following her injunctions, Devendra Babu shaved his head, performed the purificatory rite and received the Gayatri Mantra and the sacred thread from Brahmachari Krishnalal. Then he approached the mother in all humility for initiation, which she gladly granted him on. The day of the worship of Saraswati, and blessed him by presenting him a piece of cloth. On the night of the worship there was an opera in which there was no dialogue but only music, dance and a little acting. Two boys, who played the leading roles of Radha and Krishna, had such sweet voices and charming poses that the mother was highly attracted and wanted the performance to be repeated the next day. Ramakrishna Babu gladly complied. The immersion of the Devi's image was also put off to the third day, worship being performed again on the second. One incident at Kothar is highly illuminating. The mother used to take some rest after the midday meal and then she sat in the rear of the house with an attendant to have her letters written. A few days after the above incidents, the attendant found on going there for his duty that the mother sat absent-mindedly with her legs outstretched and eyes looking vacantly at something at a distance. After spending about a quarter of an hour in this mood she woke up to her surroundings and finding the attendant there, asked, 
How long have you been here? Not long, replied he. The mother then went on in her own mood to come down again and again. Is there no respite? Siva and Sati move together. Where there is Siva, there is Sati, there is no escape. Yet people don't understand. The talk continued in this strain for a pretty long time. Among other things, the mother said that the master has to incarnate from age to age for the good of his creatures, for they are his to be sure. In this connection, she alluded to one of her personal experiences. She once saw that the master had become everything, the blind, the maimed, all were he, the miseries of the creatures were his, and so the mother too had to share in the alleviation of their sufferings. When her heart was caught up in this flow of infinite compassion, she had to forego her rest and sleep, and it seemed to her then that the only rational course to follow was to give up personal comfort and think out means for the welfare of all creatures. As a consequence, when all were resting, she knew no repose. As the talk flowed on thus on a transcendental level, the vesper bells of the temple apprised her of the time of the day, and she rose hurriedly for the evening services. It was arranged that from Kothar the mother would go on a pilgrimage to Rameshwara in the extreme south. When the proposal was first mooted, the mother said, I shall go, my father-in-law went there. When the final decision had been taken, Swami Ramakrishnananda in Madras and Swami Sardananda in Calcutta were informed. Swami Sardananda heartily approved of it and Swami. Ramakrishnananda extended a cordial invitation, intimating at the same time his willingness to shoulder all responsibility. So it was settled that the pilgrims would start in the middle of February. The party consisted of Holy Mother, Brahmacharis Shukul and Krishnalal, Golapma, Ramakrishna Babu's mother and aunt, Kedar's mother, Radhu, and the attendant mentioned earlier, as also the mad aunt Surbala who was brought back by the mother on the eve of the departure. They started by the southbound Madras mail, Ramakrishna Babu accompanying them up to the Khurda Road junction, from where he went to Puri, leaving Khurda Road behind, the train proceeded southwest and steamed along the shores of the vast Chilka Lake over whose surface ripples danced under the soft morning breeze. Here and there, cranes waking with the dawn were searching for food in shallow water or darting across the blue sky in formation. Round the small islands that dotted the lake flew various kind of birds such as the Nilkanthas, blue-necked jays. At the sight of the latter, the mother became overjoyed like a girl and saluted with folded hands, for such a sight of the bird augured well. With the appearance of the sun, white masses of vapour of various shapes began to rise up and lend an airy atmosphere to the scene. The train speeded on, and the passengers looked out through the windows towards the fast-changing landscape, the vast expanse of the lake giving place to wooded undulating land. Gradually, at eight in the morning the train reached Barhampur, the headquarters of the Ganjam district. The Bengali manager of Messrs. Kellner and company was present at the platform in accordance with Swami Ramakrishnananda's request and he took the whole party to his house with great courtesy. In the afternoon, a great number of people gathered to pay their respects to the mother. They prostrated themselves before her after offering her plantains, coconuts and such other fruits. The pilgrims resumed their journey next day and passed by. Vishakapatnam in the afternoon This health resort and port town, hanging on the sides of a hillock, attracted the mother by its beauty and she said with joy, See, see, it looks just like a picture. They reached Madras next day at about noon. At Madras station, Swami Ramakrishnananda and a number of devotees were present to give a fitting reception to the Holy Mother. As the train steamed in, they raised a loud cry of jai, victory and elation. 
A two-storied house had been rented near the Ramakrishna Math at Mylapore, where the mother and her companions were taken. Here she lived for about a month during which period she visited the Kapalishwara and the Parthasarthi temples, the beach, the aquarium which was then still incomplete, and the fort. At the last place she drove in a rickshaw for the first time in her life. She used to go out every evening visiting various places of interest. At her own temporary residence there was a continuous stream of eager souls who wanted to be sanctified by touching her feet. One day the girls of a local school came to sing religious songs in Tamil and play on their violins and this pleased the mother very much. Many were initiated by her at this place. Whether it was due to the basic unity of the Indian culture or the mother's incomprehensible power of transmitting ideas, she could make the newcomers understand the mantras and the processes of japa and meditation without the help of interpreters, whose assistance she took for other purposes. In a few days, the mother's nephew Ramlal arrived at Madras for visiting Rameshwara, and it was decided that the whole party would start for Madurai, famous for its temple of the goddess Meenakshi. But just then Ramakrishna Babu's aunt fell ill, and the departure had to be postponed. But it was soon found out that the lady would take a long time to recover. Hence, after making adequate provision for her treatment and nursing, the others started on their journey. Through Swami Ramakrishnananda's scrupulous care for providing all possible comfort, the whole party had second-class accommodation in the train and he himself accompanied them to see personally to their conveniences. The train reached Madurai in the morning and they were taken to the house of the chairman of the local municipality. Madurai stands on the river Vagai. The chief temple there, dedicated to the goddess Meenakshi and her consort Sundareshwara, Siva, holds a very high place in Indian architecture. Its tall gopurams or gate towers, rising up in tiers, are very impressive because of their height, grandeur and sculpture. The mythological anecdotes represented in stone everywhere in the temple precincts keep the devout pilgrims spellbound for hours together. The image of the goddess appears so lifelike and inspiring that it is difficult to find a second one of its kind. For the disport of the two deities, there are a few permanent stone pavilions, mandapas, of which the Sasarastambha, Thousand Pillared, and Vasanta, Spring, mandapas are the best. There is a small pond built in stone called the Shivganga. The mother and others bathed in it in the afternoon and then visited the deities. Then, in accordance with the local custom, they lighted up lamps on the banks of the pond in each one's name before returning to their residence. During their stay at Madurai, they visited among other places the palace of Tirumal Naika and the large tank called Tepakulam, 1000 x 950. The extensive roof of the palace is supported by 125 stone pillars. In the center of the tank there is a small island. All these sights made the mother exclaim, How wonderful is the play of the master! From Madurai they entrained for Rameshwara and reached Mandapam at noon from where they had to cross over in a steamer to the Pamban or Rameshwara island. From Pamban, which is also the name of the port across the strait, they again boarded a train and reached Rameshwara at about 11 in the night. As the temple was closed, they saluted the deity from outside and went to live in the quarters arranged for them by the priest guide Gangaram Pitambar. Next morning they bathed in the sea and entered the temple, which in its massiveness and extensiveness seems to be unparalleled. It is built of stone. Round the sanctum sanctorum there are three successive encircling corridors. The outermost one is 17 feet wide and measures 645 feet from east to west and 395 feet from north to south. 
The middle one is 500 feet and 300 feet respectively. At the entrance of the whole structure is a huge gopuram, every inch of which is full of fine sculpture. The story of Siva, the presiding deity of the temple, is told in stone pillars and walls that line the corridor. On entering the innermost corridor, one finds in front the stone image of Nandi, Siva's bull, which is as high as a one-storied building and near the Nandi is a tall pillar. The emblem of Rameshwara is placed in a small basin, Kunda. As the image is made of soft sandy material, it is kept covered by a golden cap over which the Abhishekha, bathing, water is poured. But early in the morning, one can have a look at the uncovered image. For the daily Abhishekha and for other rites of the daily worship of Rameshwara, Ganges water alone is permitted. This is brought from North India with considerable effort and is sold to pilgrims in small quantities to be poured over the covered emblem of Siva. Then the Pamban Island, as also the Rameshwara Temple, was under the administrative control of the Raja of Ramnad who was a disciple of Swami Vivekananda. He had instructed the temple staff by telegram that as the Guru of his Guru would be visiting the shrine, all facilities should be offered to her. As a consequence, the Holy Mother and her party were taken to the Sanctum Sanctorum, contrary to the general custom, and were allowed to worship the uncovered Siva image to their heart's content with Ganges water, flowers, etc. The Mother offered 108 golden leaves shaped like the real leaves of the bell tree. During all the three days that they stayed there, they visited the temple every morning and evening. On the third day the Holy Mother arranged for a special worship at the temple, fed the pandas after hearing a recital of the glory of Rameshwara from old scriptures, and she presented to each of the pandas a water pot. It is customary to sit with betel and betel nut in hand at the time of hearing Rameshwara's exploits and offer them to the reader at the end. The mother faithfully observed all the customs. The temple staff had been instructed by the Raja to show the temple jewellery to the mother and present her any piece that she might ask for. When the Raja's wishes were communicated to the mother she was at a loss to think out what she might really be in need of and so she said after a pause, What can I need? Whatever was necessary has been arranged for by Sashi, Swami Ramakrishnananda. And then it struck her that such a refusal might offend them, and hence she corrected herself, Well, if Radhu has any need of anything, she will take it. And to Radhu, she said, See, if you can choose anything you may have need of. The mother said so out of curtsy, but when the treasury was opened and the gems and diamonds glittered up, her heart began to throb and she kept on praying, Master, may not Radhu have any temptation. The master heard her. After looking at everything, Radhu said, What is there worth taking from all this stuff? I don't want any of these. I have lost my writing pencil, buy one for me. At this the mother was immensely relieved and came out to purchase from a roadside shop a pencil worth half an anna. Brahmachari Krishnalal, who was an attendant of the mother and who visited Rameshwara with her, said to Sarla Devi one day that on looking at the uncovered Siva image the mother soliloquized, it is just as I had left it. The devotees that were near at hand inquired, What did you say, mother? The mother at once corrected herself and said, A meaningless something escaped out of my lips. After the party had returned to Calcutta, one day Kedar Babu of Kolpara asked the mother at the Udbodhan, How did you find Rameshwar? And the mother replied, He is just as I had left him, my son. Then the ever alert Golapma was passing by the veranda. As soon as these words fell on her ears, she stopped and asked with enthusiasm, What did you say, mother? Taken aback, the mother said, Why, what should I say? 
I was only saying that I was very much delighted to see it just as I had heard from you. But Golapma was not to be put off so easily, and she said importunately, No, mother, I have heard everything, it won't do to retract your words now. Isn't it, dear Kedar? And she whisked away without waiting for a reply to tell everyone of the good tidings. The devotees believe that the same personage who incarnated in the Tretha Yuga as Sita, the ever-faithful consort of Ramchandra, and worshipped a Siva image made of sand on the sea coast of Rameshwara, descended again as the all-enduring and ever-gracious Holy Mother, so that the sudden sight of the uncovered image carried her mind unconsciously across the vast span of thousands of years, and the past appeared as a vivid present, and forgetful of her immediate environment she made that. Spontaneous Remark Dhanuskoti is another sacred place in the island, from where the bridge thrown across the sea by Sri Rama commences. It is customary to worship the sea by presenting a golden or silver bow and arrow. As the mother could not go there, she sent two of her attendants with the silver bow and arrow to perform the worship on her behalf. From Rameshwara they returned to Madurai, where they rested for a day and then they proceeded to Madras. Now, the birthday of the Master approached, and the devotees took advantage of the Mother's presence to make the occasion a great day of joyful celebration. Some people were initiated by her on that day. After the celebration, she left for Bangalore on the 10th of Chatra, end of March, 1911. In those days, the surroundings of the Ramakrishna Ashrama at Bangalore were quite and charming. And even at the present time the Ashrama with its extensive grounds continues to preserve that solitude in spite of the rapid growth of the city. The compound is dotted with valuable fruit and flower trees. In front runs the wide bull temple road leading to the temple of that name, which enshrines a huge image of Nandi and is visited by streams of pilgrims. The mother and her women companions were accommodated in the ashrama building, while the monks and devotees lived in temporary tents outside. As the news of the mother's visit spread over the town, devotees began to come in great numbers, and the flowers they brought for offering sometimes formed big heaps. At Bangalore the mother stayed for about a week. One afternoon she was taken by Swami Vishuddhananda in a carriage to the cave temple of Gavipura, a short distance behind the ashrama. The mother got down and visited the temple and then returned to the ashrama by the same carriage. The whole time spent outside was not long. But whereas at the time of their going out, there was none there at the ashrama besides the inmates, when they returned they found the whole compound crowded with a number of visitors. At the sound of the mother's carriage they stood up instantaneously and then prostrated themselves on the ground. The mother, who was visibly moved by the sight, alighted from the carriage and stood there motionless for about five minutes, extending her right arm in benediction. Perfect silence reigned all around, and the whole atmosphere was charged with awe. Then the mother silently walked to the ashrama and sat in the central room where the devotees gathered. Here again was enacted that speechless transmission and imbibition of transcendental bliss that the scriptures speak of. There was no question and no answer, and yet all doubts were resolved. Breaking that tangible silence, the mother said to Swami Vishuddhananda who was by her side, What a pity, I don't know their language. What solace they would derive, if I could but speak a few words. When Swami Vishuddhananda translated this for the devotees, they said, No, no, this is all right. Our hearts are full indeed. No words are needed on such an occasion. Wonderful are the ways of the mother and wonderful are those of her children. Here is another incident. There is a small hillock behind the ashrama building and within its own compound. 
A short while before dark, the mother climbed the hillock along with one or two others and sat on its top enjoying the beauty of the setting sun. When Swami Ramakrishnananda heard of this, he said in amazement, Indeed, the mother has become a dweller on the mountain. Parvatvasini won and hurried towards the place. He was stout and began to pant as he climbed that low hillock, but undaunted he went up straight to the mother, prostrated himself there and laying his head on her feet chanted three well-known verses from the Chandi beginning with Sarvamangala Mangalye which are used as mantras for the salutation of the Divine Mother. O auspicious one, Thou art the source of all auspiciousness, Thou art the accomplisher of all cherished desires. Thou art the giver of refuge. Thou possessest the eye of wisdom and beautiful form. O Thou power divine, salutations to Thee. O eternal one, Thou art the energy of creation, preservation and destruction. Thou art the abode of threefold cosmic energy, and Thou art also its manifester. O Thou Power Divine, salutations to Thee. O Mother, Thou art the Saviour of the distressed and of the careworn, who take refuge in Thee. Thou art the remover of misery of all. O Thou Power Divine, salutations to Thee. And He prayed grace. Grace. The Mother caressed His head, as though pacifying an importunate son, till Swami. Ramakrishnananda felt himself fully blessed. There was a funny incident at Bangalore. One day the Holy Mother, dressed in her own simple way, sat at one side of the central room and women visitors came to pay their respects to her. With them came a rich woman wearing fine clothes and costly ornaments. She took her seat in the center of the room. A little later a group of women came and finding the wealthy lady in the center mistook her for the mother. Therefore, they proceeded to salute her. The lady's protests were of no avail, the newcomers pressed on to touch her feet. At this the aristocratic lady jumped up and remonstrated vehemently. By that time, however, she was completely surrounded, and there was a scamper for the first touch of her feet, so that she had to extricate herself somehow and walk out. The mother sat quietly at her corner all the while, and though she did not grasp one word of what the ladies spoke, she understood with a quiet smile the farce that was going on in front of her. After spending some days at Bangalore, the mother and her companions returned to Madras, where they spent a day or two and then started for Calcutta. On the way they rested a day at Rajmandri where they were guests at the house one of Shri M. O. Parthasarthi Ayengar, district and Sessions Judge. The mother bade here in the Godavari. Their second halting place was Puri. This time they did not go to the Kshetra Basir Math, but went to Sashiniketana, the other house of the Bos, where they spent some three or four days. At last they arrived at Calcutta on the 28th of Chatra, middle of April, 1911. The first day that the mother set her holy feet on the grounds of the Belur Mat, after her South Indian pilgrimage, she was given a fitting reception. As a result of the long sojourn, she had returned with better health and a happier mind, which gladdened the devotees also. Moreover, the wonderful news of the enthusiasm created in the South by her inspiring presence and silent ministration had preceded her. And hence all had gathered there to express their devout gratefulness for her unbounded love for her children. The gates of the math were decorated with plantain trees, under which were placed tastefully painted pitchers filled with water and with green leaves on the top. On either side of the path stood more than a hundred devotees with folded hands. As the carriage of the mother came in sight a few crackers were burst, and as the mother alighted and moved slowly with her women companions, the devotees chanted the mantras from the Chandi, the order of Swami Brahmananda, abbot of the math, 
rang out that nobody should break the line to salute the mother by touching her feet. So the mother walked unhampered. Her whole body was covered from head to foot with a white cotton wrapper, and it seemed as though a sacred and animated white image had suddenly descended on the math ground and was moving silently from south to north. Suddenly somebody seemed to dart out of the line and as quickly salute the mother and disappear. Catch him, catch him, who's that, who's that, called out Swami Brahmananda in great amusement. It was none other than Swami Subodhananda, who, because of his being younger than most of the other disciples of Sri Ramakrishna and his simple nature, was called by the others. Khoka Maharaj or the baby monk. This exploit of the Swami amused the company very much. The mother was taken to the main monastery building. A kirtana in honor of Kali was then in progress in the courtyard below and Swami Brahmananda sat there. Suddenly it was seen that the Swami's body had become absolutely motionless and his smoke pipe had dropped from his hand. As he did not come round from this state of divine trance, the mother was informed and she instructed someone to utter a mantra in the Swami's ears. This acted like magic and the Swami came down to the normal plane with words of appreciation for the music, Bravo. Sing on, sing on, as though he had been unmindful just for a passing moment. The mother was now offered some prasada of the master. She took a little and sent down the rest of it which the devotees eagerly shared amongst themselves. When in the evening she took leave, a few more crackers were burst to indicate the end of the happy day's function. One, which is a name of the Divine Mother dwelling on the Himalayas or the Vindhya Hills. One, the house is no longer in existence, the plot of land having been acquired by the municipal waterworks.